Jesus at the cross defeated the devil, defeated sickness, defeated poverty, defeated depression. He's done everything and he's placed all of this on the inside of us. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in us bodily. And you aren't trying to get God to do something for you. He's already done everything. It's a matter of us just receiving what has already been done. It's really as simple as renewing our mind and just believing that it's done. And when you begin to start believing, it releases the supernatural power of God that's already been there. It's a total different way of looking at things. I mean, totally different. And like I said earlier in this teaching, it's hard for me to get people to see this. I can argue people into healing, I can argue them into prosperity, I can argue them into a lot of different things, but I have never been able to just argue a person into accepting and believing and understanding this. And I think the reason for it is because I'm saying that you've already got it when in the natural realm, your five senses show all kinds of things in our life that we don't have. We've got sickness instead of healing. We've got poverty instead of prosperity. We've got depression and fear instead of joy and peace and all of these things. And so people, most people are just dominated and controlled by the physical, natural realm. They cannot believe that something exists that they can't see. And I think that's why it's so hard to get people to see this because most of us are what the Bible calls carnal. That just means dominated by your five senses. If you can't see it, taste it, feel it, smell it, or hear it, then it doesn't exist. But that is not true. There is a spiritual world out there and there's also a spiritual part of you on the inside. And if you've been born again, you are completely brand new on the inside. And the only way to really grasp this and understand it is to start understanding and recognizing the spiritual world, to walk by faith and not by sight. Look at these verses over in 2 Corinthians, and I'm going to start with chapter 4 and go into some of the verses in chapter 5. But this is Paul talking, and he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and in verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul here is talking about we are looking at things that cannot be seen. Did you know that the average person today there's just an automatic disconnect right there because how can, if you can't see it, then how can you look at it? Our world today does not believe in the spiritual world. They do not believe in spiritual things. I could illustrate this in a million different ways and spend all my time trying to make this one point, but if you're paying attention, our world is carnal to the max. If it can't be proven in a test tube, if it can't be proven by a quote unquote science, then they do not believe that it exists. We have become so sophisticated that we don't believe in any of these things. And yet according to scripture, did you know over half of the healings that Jesus performed on people, he did it by casting demons out. Demons cause deafness, blindness, curvature of the spine, seizures, I'm sure there's a lot of other things. That's just off the top of my head. Those things were demonic in the Bible. And yet today, people just always think that every physical problem is organic. It's physical. It's natural. And that's not true. There are demonic spirits at work all of the time. A lot of Christians believe, oh yeah, there are demons, but they're all over in Africa. I guarantee you, there's a lot of demons in this place this morning. Some of you are thinking, that's not so. Didn't you pray to put the blood over this so that no demons could come in? I guarantee you, if we didn't allow any demons in here, there wouldn't be near as many people in this place as well. <laughs> Depression is demonic. Unforgiveness is demonic. Bitterness is demonic. There's a lot of things going on. And you know... People, I heard people say, you plead the blood over this and no demons can get in here. If, they, if demons were to come in, they'd have to come through the blood. 
You can turn over to the Gospels and read about the Last Supper and Satan himself was present at the Last Supper and entered into Judas Iscariot. If Jesus couldn't keep the devil out of his communion with his 12 disciples, you can't keep the devil out of your church service. There's demons in here, but you know what? There's angels in here, there's, good, there's godly things. And I guarantee you the devil is with everything he's worth. He's trying to hide this morning. He does not want to get out in the open because he'll be gone if he does. And so anyway, there's a spiritual world and the average Christian really doesn't believe that. The average Christian looks at everything in the natural. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You are fighting a spiritual battle. And yet the average Christian doesn't know that. I guarantee you in ministry, you aren't gonna go very far if you don't learn this lesson. Because when you become a minister, you've got a big target drawn on your back and Satan is gonna send people across your path that criticize you. They'll criticize the way you do everything. And if you take it personally and think that it's just people and stuff, you aren't gonna last very long in the ministry. You've got to get to the place that you realize that Satan uses people. Satan speaks through people. And it's not only true of ministers, it's true of every one of you. Much of the stuff that goes on in your family with your relations and stuff, it's demonic. It's, it's people against you because of your stand for the Lord. There's spiritual things going on. But the average Christian in a practical way does not approach things from a spiritual basis. They don't even understand and recognize. Like when it comes to healing or something, they just go to the doctor. I, I couldn't tell you how many people I've prayed for. And man, the power of God hit them and they said, man, I felt that I believe I'm healed. And I'll say, praise God. And they'll say, I'm gonna go to the doctor and see if it worked. <laughs> and I just want a spirit of slap wants to come all over me. Like, why don't you just believe that something happened? But until they can see it in the physical realm, they don't believe that it's real. They believe that it's foolishness to believe that you're healed, to believe that you're prospered, to believe the word of God if you can't find it in the physical realm somehow. They depend upon all of these natural things. I'm telling you that is not the way that God made us to work. Paul here is saying, that the reason he was able to shrink his problems down to where it's just a light affliction is because he looked at things that couldn't be seen. He was seen with his heart. And he goes on to say, I'm not, for time's sake, I'm gonna skip some of these verses, but in the first few verses of chapter five, he's talking about if our physical body was to die, that's fine because we have a body in heaven, a tabernacle, a tent that's been prepared for the Lord. And did you know there is no physical proof of that? There's people today that doubt the existence of heaven and hell because it can't be proven and no science has proven it. it. It always amazes me, the Christians that are so excited over somebody that says they found Noah's Ark, that they've done this. You know, I held a piece of Noah's Ark in my hand when I was at this uh, creation research or creation evidence museum in Glen Rose, Texas. And man, some people just got so excited over it. It doesn't matter to me whether that's actually Noah's Ark or not because I believe it. I don't have to have somebody prove it to me, but there's so many Christians that, oh, if we could just prove that Noah's Ark was real, if we could go back and prove this. Jesus was talking to his father and an audible voice came out of heaven and said, this is my beloved son, hear him. And when the people heard it, some of them said it was thunder. It was an audible voice and it, and it recorded what he said and yet people rejected it. I'm telling you people that have to have something physical and natural to prove everything. Like these books come out. I, I've had people give me these books and they say, oh, here's a, here's a brain surgeon who's saying the same thing that you're saying about words and the power of words and how it affects your body. And they get so excited because here's a medical doctor who says it. And I say, well, great. Give it to somebody who doesn't believe the word to help them. I don't have to have that to convince me. But there's so many people get excited because all oh, the medical realm, the physical realm is confirming the word of God. Who gives a rip? 
But there are so many Christians that have to have these natural things to bolster their faith, and that just is an indication, a revelation, that their faith truly isn't in the Lord. Faith comes by hearing the word. And if you were to hear an audible voice from God, and yet you have this mindset that you've got to get everything proven empirically, scientifically, then you would come up and say, oh, it was thunder. You would find a way to excuse it away as people did in Jesus' day. I've seen this. I've seen people raised from the dead. I've seen miracle upon miracle upon miracle happen, and I've had people stand right there and see the miracles and say, that's not God. They weren't really sick. I was just with a guy, Nathan Morris. Some of you may know him. He's the one who's preaching the Bay Revival, and he showed me this video of a woman who had been paralyzed for, I forgot how many years, 25 years, and she got up out of the chair and walked had been paralyzed for 25 years and got up and walked. Nightline got it and they put it on Nightline and they put it on ABC and CBS and all of these major networks and it's caused a big stir. And did you know that the very woman who got up and walked called him the next day and she didn't believe she was healed. And he had to go over and she says, I, I think you must have been pulling me up and picking me up and kind of moving my life. I'm not sure that I was healed. And he played the video for her from the night before. And when she saw the video, then she believed that she was healed. And she got up and walked, and now she's running and walking and stuff. But I tell you what, it, people that have a desire to disbelieve, they are just skeptical. And they're gonna only believe if it can be proven and somehow or another forced upon them in the natural realm you are never going to contact God. Paul was talking about this body. If it dies, we've got another body. You cannot prove that. You have to accept that by faith based on what the Word of God says. And you have to look at things that can't be seen. And then he makes this statement in chapter 5, in verse 7. seven he says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Did you know for the vast majority of the body of Christ, you can totally reverse that. We walk by sight and not by faith. That's a shame, but that's where the vast majority of us are. We are so dominated by our physical senses. And if we feel a pain, then that proves that we aren't healed. That doesn't prove a thing. The devil can hit you with a pain. The devil can, I, I pray for people all of the time and I've had people that have had pain for 20, 30, 40 years, have never been a moment without pain. I pray for them and instantly all of their pain's gone. And I'll say, you know why? And they'll say, no, why do I not have pain? I'll say, it's because you're healed. And they're just thinking, maybe it just left for a moment. I mean, they, they've had pain for 20 years and they're instantly free and they're skeptical about maybe it just is gone for a moment. Man, it's a good thing I'm not God. I'd just turn you into a pile of ashes when something like that happens. <laughs> but I often tell people after I've prayed for them, I'll say, look, if you ever have another pain, it does not mean you weren't healed. It doesn't mean that you've lost your healing. It just means that the devil knows I believe what I'm saying. And so when I rebuke him and command him to leave, he leaves, but he's not sure you believe it. And so he can come back and the devil can put a pain on you. You know, I have pains. I have things hit my body all of the time. I've had chest pains and stuff that have knocked me to my knees before and stuff. And most people, oh, you got heart problems. And they immediately just react to it. And I sit there and say, no, in the name of Jesus, amen. And I, I guarantee I'm as healthy as a horse. I don't have any problems, but I'm saying I've had pains and things come at me, but it's People have a tendency towards the physical, the natural. You've been taught what this pain means, what this means, and you just gravitate to it. You run in fear towards all of these things. The average Christian is as carnal as they can possibly be and controlled by the natural, and they are walking by sight and not by faith. This is not how the Bible tells us to live. You ought to be more aware of what you have in Christ and who you are in Christ. And it ought to get to where who you are in Christ is more real to you than what you see with your physical eyes. Amen. And some of you are thinking, yeah, so you just live in this 
make-believe world the whole time and ignore all the physical. I'm not saying that you ignore the physical, but you put a greater emphasis, a greater belief on the spiritual. And when you do that, then your body and all of the physical circumstances will eventually change. I'm not denying that the physical world exists. I'm just denying that that's all that there is. I'm saying that there is a spiritual world on the inside of me and outside, and the spiritual world is the parent force. The spiritual world created this physical world. Spiritual things existed before there were tangible things. Tangible things are the byproduct of spiritual reality. The spiritual world is more real than the physical world. And if you got to where you believe that and learn through the Word of God what you have in the spiritual world and learn how to speak it into existence and how to cooperate, well, then you can change this physical world with the spiritual realities. The parent force is greater than the force that it's created. The spiritual world is real. Let me turn over and show you some things here in Genesis chapter 3. This will take a little bit of thought I know that most people are come to church to get entertained, but you're going to have to think a little bit. It'll be worth the effort. Amen. Here in Genesis chapter three is where Satan tempted Adam and Eve. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here's what it says in Genesis chapter three, verse seven. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. You know, this says that their eyes were open. What do you think this means? Does this mean that Adam and Eve had been walking around with their eyes closed? Does this mean that they were like puppies that when you were first, you know, created, you can't see? And it takes a while for your eyes to be open. Well, the, the previous verse says that they, when they saw the tree, that it was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. It's obvious their eyes were open. Their eyes, their physical eyes had been open since God created them. But this talks about their eyes were open. What's this talking about? What happened when they ate of the tree? And the very first thing that happened was they realized they were naked. You know what? They didn't realize all of the things about sin and everything that was going to happen. The, uh, the first thing they realized was that they were naked. And you know, you'll hear people talk about that Adam and Eve were clothed with the glory of the Lord. They had a robe of righteousness on and all of these kind of things. And when they sinned, they lost this clothing and they became naked. You can say things like that for the purpose of an analogy an allegory, but in reality, they were both naked before they sinned and, and just as naked as they were after they sinned. You can see that up here in the second chapter in verse 25, it says they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They were but naked before they sinned. My point here is that Adam and Eve were naked and had never noticed that they were naked. Most of us are just like, how does this work? You know, I could spend more time on this. I'm just going to say it and move on to another point, but I hope you can get this. I believe that God created Adam and Eve with not just five senses, but he created us with six senses. And the sixth sense was faith, the ability to see with our heart to perceive the unseen realm. And I believe that Adam and Eve were dominated by spiritual sight. They were seeing and hearing with their heart. They were more spiritual than they were physical. They had all of the physical stuff, but they were spiritual. They were dominated. They were like Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that they walked by faith and not by sight. That's not to say that they didn't have sight, but their sight wasn't dominant. It was what they perceived in their heart. This is how they communicated with God every day in the cool of the evening. There isn't any indication that they physically saw the Lord, that they physically heard the Lord, but they could hear him in their heart. They were hearing and seeing by faith. And you can see that because when they ate of the tree, all of a sudden, 
Their physical eyes became dominant. Their spiritual eyesight closed and they begin to be dominant. And for the first time, they realized they were naked. Prior to that time, they were so God conscious that they never even noticed whether they had clothes on or not. Boy, most of us can't even relate to this. We were born into a physical world, into a sinful physical world, and we've all been raised in a way that we are just controlled by our senses. We can't even imagine being so God conscious that your mind is so stayed on God that when you get up in the morning, you don't even pay attention whether you put on clothes or not. You don't even think about your flesh. And let me just say that if you get so spiritually minded, that you're like that, please have mercy on all the rest of us that are carnal, amen, and put on your clothes, amen. We live in a fallen world, so I'm not telling you not to wear clothes. I'm just saying that Adam and Eve were so God conscious that they didn't even notice whether or not they were clothed. But as soon as they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's like their spiritual eyesight closed and all of a sudden they became like we are dominated by only what they could see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And they lost this spiritual awareness, this spiritual consciousness. What most of us consider to be normal is abnormal. We talk about our five senses. I believe God made us with six senses. And it's like our appendix or, you know, part of our body that they say they don't understand what the original purpose of it was. We don't know what it's for, but it's still there. I believe that all of us have this ability to walk by faith. Even a lost man still has an ability to know things intuitively that they can't figure out with their brain. I bet you every person in here has had a time, sometime or another, that you were making choices, you were looking at your choices, and you were, uh, you know, wondering what you should do and logic and everybody's advice told you to take this right hand turn. And yet you felt like you wanted to go this other direction. You went ahead and followed logic. You did what was logical. It failed. And you look back and you said, I knew I was supposed to do this. There was no logic to it. There was no physical reason, but you just knew things by your heart. And every one of us have wound up making mistakes because we didn't follow the intuitive things that we have on the inside. I believe God made us to be able to know things by our heart. Like Paul was talking about, to see things that can't be seen, to walk by faith and not by sight. This is how God intended us to live. And yet most of us have become so carnal minded that this is the reason we have trouble understanding that We're already blessed when we look at our bank account and it doesn't look blessed. We listen to the doctor and he says, you're going to die. We listen to the lawyer and he says, your case is impossible. And we are just more controlled by this physical, natural realm. But the truth is we have the ability to know things by our heart, to see with our heart and know things that you can't know with your little peanut brain. And this is one of those things that you have to perceive and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The word of God is like a window into the spiritual world. Not only the spiritual world out here, but a world, a window into who you are in the spirit. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter one, verse three, that blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, that's past tense, already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are already blessed. You're already blessed. And yet the average person says, oh God, bless me. You're already blessed. Oh, but I'm not blessed because here's my bank statement. Here's my doctor's report. You look at the physical and because you can't see it in the physical, you don't believe God has done anything in the spiritual. But if you could understand that in your spirit, you are blessed. Did you know that when the angel appeared unto Mary and said, hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. That Greek word that was translated highly favored is only used one other time in the Bible. And that's in Ephesians chapter one, where I think it's verse six, where it says you are accepted in the beloved. When it says that Mary was highly favored, did you know that that's exactly what God has said about you? Every one of you is highly favored. You are blessed. 
You are accepted in the beloved. That's true in the spirit realm. And yet we look at some person who's rejected us, some person who doesn't appreciate us, who's done something and we think, but I'm not blessed and you want God to bless you. It's because you're only looking in the physical, natural realm. If you could see by faith, if you could see what God has done for you, then that faith put with what God has already accomplished by grace releases power and it would change your life. You know, I have favor, and I'm not saying this in a bragging way. I'm saying it thankful to the Lord, but I believe I'm blessed. If any of you have asked me how I am this week, I can guarantee you I've answered you, I'm blessed. I say that all of the time. I tell people I'm blessed, and there's times I don't feel blessed. There's times I don't look blessed. But you know what? I believe I'm blessed, and I say it, and I speak blessing over me, and because of it, I just have favor. I have favor everywhere I go. And it's not because God loves me more than anybody else. He loves all of us the same. It's by grace. But I believe God loves me. And because of it, that favor that is in the spiritual realm is spilling over into the physical realm. You know, I was stopped by a policeman. I forget, I forget when this was, maybe a year ago or something. I've been stopped two or three times for speeding. <laughs> and you know what? I just say guilty. I said, you know what, I deserve, give me whatever you want. I said, I'm sorry, I was talking, I was doing this or whatever. And you know what, my, I tell these things to my sons and my sons say, I'm sure they let you go. And I said, yeah, they let me go and said, just slow down. <laughs> you know what, I'm blessed. I don't know what to say other than I'm blessed and I believe I'm blessed. And I've been stopped at least three times by cops in the last 10, 15 years. And you know what, I get off every time because I'm just blessed. Some of you think, ah, it doesn't work that way. Well, don't wake me up. This is the way I'm living. I'm just blessed. I'm telling you, there's, there's things going beyond what your little peanut brain can see and figure out. There is a spiritual world, and if you would believe that you're blessed, if you would believe that God is with you, it'll change the way you react to things. It changes the way that things happen. There is a spiritual world. And I believe that God created us to live by faith and not by sight. The way that this world exists and the way that most Christians exist is way, way, way substandard, subnormal to what God intended. What Paul is talking about when he says we walk by faith and not by sight. We look at things that can't be seen. That's the normal Christian life. If we were looking at the spiritual realm, if we could look past our problems and see the goodness of God and all of the blessings of God, I guarantee you, you ought to be rejoicing. You ought to be having a continual feast. I don't care if you're, the doctor tells you you're dying, if the banker tells you he's going to repossess everything. It doesn't matter what's going on in the spiritual realm. Who you are in Christ is so much greater than any physical problem you could ever have. It pales in comparison. And the good news is that if you became spiritually minded like this, the Bible says, Romans chapter 8, verse 6, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But to be carnally minded is death. Instead of this being, well, you're just living in an alternate reality. You're living in a fantasy land and, and you aren't dealing with reality. It's really just the opposite. When you get to where you can walk by faith and perceive what God has done for you, it changes this reality. It produces life and peace. If you aren't having life and peace, it's because you aren't spiritually minded. You're carnally minded. Carnal mindedness produces death. You know, if I went to your home and saw your garden, I don't have to be there when you planted it. Just let me go to you and see what's growing in your garden and I can tell you what you planted. That's right. Everything produces after its own kind. I don't have to go home with you. I can look at you right now. Are you sick? Are you poor? Are you depressed? Are you discouraged? Are you angry? Are you bitter? Are you stressed out? And on and on you could go. If you've got that growing in you, it's because you were carnally minded not spiritually minded. Spiritually minded grows life and peace. Carnal mindedness grows death. That's it. 
If we could begin to start perceiving what the Word has to say, and this is the reason I love the Word of God, because the Word of God, it is spirit and it is life. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 63 said, uh, Jesus was speaking, and he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are alive. The Word of God is spiritual. It tells you what's going on behind the scenes. You know, I recently uh, bought a book about Robert E. Lee. We've been to all of these uh, uh, Civil War sites, and I went to Robert E. Lee's home, and I wanted to read some things. And anyway, I read his book, and it was really interesting. I'm a history buff and like that kind of stuff. And it was good, but I was so frustrated because they would talk about, did you know that the Civil War should have been won by the South? The South, within the two or three years, had the Union Army on the run, had them surrounded. The Union Army should have lost the Civil War within the first couple of years. There is no logical explana explanation for it. And I would read these things about how that they had the Union Army basically surrounded and defeated and yet something would happen and their, their uh, communication to one of the other generals wouldn't happen, something, they just let it go and they don't know what it was. And I was so frustrated because see, I'm used to reading the Bible. And in the Bible, you read about them walking around the walls of Jericho and shouting and the walls falling down flat and you know exactly why it happened. You know exactly why the Syrians were defeated because an angel went out and killed 185,000 of the soldiers in one night. And it gives you what's going on in the spiritual realm. It's showing you that an angel did this and that. But when I read Robert E. Lee's book, it was just talking about here's what happened in the physical and you don't know why it happened. I would have loved to have known why those things didn't work out. I guarantee you there was a lot of spiritual intervention and things going on behind the scenes. And I just felt like, you know, I, I'm reading something and getting only half of the story. The thing I love about the Bible is it shows you what's going on behind the scenes. It shows you why Elijah called fire down out of heaven, why he was able to raise the one, widow's son from the dead. It tells you how this happened. It gives you insight into the spiritual realm. The Word of God will make you spiritually minded. It will reveal things to you. And if you don't spend time in the Word of God, you are going to automatically default to being carnally minded and only looking at things in the natural realm. The Word of God, it, it just makes you spiritually minded. Look over in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, and this is the exact opposite of what happened to Adam and Eve. In 2 Kings chapter 6 is where the king of Syria had been attacking the king of Israel and every time he would send his troops into Israel, Elisha, the prophet of God, would get a word from God. God would tell him. We don't know if it's in an audible voice or if it was in his heart. Scripture doesn't explain, but God would communicate with Elisha and tell him exactly what the king of Syria was going to do. So Elisha would send to the king of Israel and tell him, don't go here, the king of Syria has got an ambush for you. And the king of Israel would ambush the king of Syria's ambush. And this happened so many times, Syria was being beaten every single time that finally the king of Syria said, somebody here is, is for the king of Israel. In other words, somebody's a traitor. They've got to be giving away my battle plans. That's the only way that this could happen. And one of his servants said, it's none of us, O Lord, my Lord, the king, but the Elisha, the man of God, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber. This was not happening because he had some listening device in the king of Syria's bedchamber. It wasn't because of technology. It wasn't something in the natural. He was hearing this by the spirit. He had spiritual hearing. God was telling him this. And so the king of Syria sent his troops down to find Elisha. They found him in the city of Dothan. And here in 2 Kings chapter 6, it says in verse 15, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, the host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? This is just old English for the guy panicked. 
It's like, what are we going to do? He knew that, man, they had been giving out the king of Syria's battle plans. Here were all of the Syrian armies surrounding them. And when he got out and saw the Syrians, he knew that, man, they had been found out. And he comes to Elisha and he says, my master, what are we going to do? And in verse 16, he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Did you know that most people who are carnal, physically minded, and only believe that this physical world is real and that everything else is just make-believe, those people would have said, Elisha lied. Because you could count the Syrians by 1,000, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and then you look over and go, one, two. <laughs> if all you believe is real is the physical world, then this was a lie. And this is what a lot of people today believe faith people are, that they're just lying. it. They're just faking it until they make it. There's a lot of people that they think faith is saying something is so when it really isn't so. And if you'll say it long enough and believe it, then it will become so. But that's what a lot of people think faith is. Faith is making a statement that isn't real. But if you'll make it and believe it, then it'll become real. That's not true. That's not true. And that kind of attitude is what gives faith a bad result because there's people that'll sit there and you know, you can tell by looking at them, they're green, they're sick. And you'll say, what's wrong with you? Nothing, I'm healed. But you're green. No, I'm not green. There's people that think that that's faith. Faith is not denying the physical world and faith is not denying that there is physical reality and that you may have sickness in your body or you may have poverty or you may have a problem. That's not faith to deny that this physical world exists. But faith is just an ability to see beyond the physical world and see the spiritual realm that is also real and that exists. When Elisha said, they that be with us are more than those that be with God, he was not lying. He was telling the truth. He was speaking reality, but it wasn't a physical reality. There is a spiritual world that exists. And I'm sure that his, his servant thought, oh man, this guy's been writing the Bible too much or something. He thought he had just lost it. And so Elisha in verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And Elisha went out and just raised his hand and said, Lord, smite them all with blindness. And the entire Syrian army went blind and he told them to join hands and he led them single file holding hands into the midst of Samaria, took them all captive, had them surrounded by the Israeli army and then he prayed and God opened up his eyes, opened up their eyes. And he took the whole army captive without firing a single arrow, without doing anything. It was all through the power of God. And when he prayed and said, Lord, open up this young man's eyes, I can guarantee you Gehazi's eyes were huge. He was looking at all of those troops out there. This isn't talking about his physical eyes. It's not like he had his physical eyes closed, but his eyes of his heart were closed. You know, this is what the Lord said many times. He said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He that has eyes to see, let him see. Every person in the crowd had physical eyes and physical ears. The Lord wasn't talking about if you have eyes and if you have ears here. No, he was talking about their heart. If you can see with your heart, God gave us an ability to know things by the spirit and to see with our heart. And this is what you've got to do in order to be able to understand that everything's already done in Christ. You have to get to where you take the word of God and let it paint a picture and you believe the spiritual representation that's given in the word of God as much or more than you believe what you see with your physical eyes. When this man's eyes were open, it wasn't talking about his physical eyes, the eyes of his heart were open. And he saw horses and chariots round about. And you know what Elisha said was true. The horses and chariots of fire were there and they didn't just come there when his eyes were open. They were already there. They were in the spiritual world. And you know, the scripture says that what we have in Christ is far superior to what any Old Testament saint had. So if Elisha 
had thousands of horses and chariots of fire surrounding him, then I've got at least tens of thousands of horses and chariots of fire surrounding me. And you've got tens of thousands surrounding you. And you multiply that times the thousand people in here. And man, we got millions and millions and millions of angels in here surrounding us. Somebody says, well, I don't believe that. Why? Because you can't see it. You can't feel it. That doesn't mean they aren't here. It just means you're carnal. It means you aren't spiritual. It means you aren't walking by faith. You're walking by sight. And that's telling you why you're depressed and why you're sick and why you're poor because you can't believe anything that you can't see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. You're going to have to get to where you start walking in the Spirit. This is the exact opposite of what happened to Eve. Eve's eyes were open at first and she was walking by faith and she was so God conscious she never even noticed whether she had clothes on or not. But when sin entered, her spiritual eyes closed and her physical eyes opened and they became carnal. And then all of her descendants were all carnal. And here comes this man who is living in the carnal realm, thinking that only what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, this is only reality that there is. And he was walking by sight, and, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open up his eyes. And the Lord opened his eyes up so that he could see with his heart, and he saw into the spiritual world. He saw things that existed before he could see them. And you know what? Here's another thing. Elisha, it never says that Elisha saw this. There isn't any indication that Elisha saw all of the horses and chariots of fire. He didn't have to see them. He believed it. You know, seeing is believing, but not seeing with your eyes. Seeing with your heart. You can get to where you see things in your heart and it's more real to you than what you see with your eyes. I believe Elisha had already seen the horses and chariots of God in 2 Kings chapter 2 when Elijah was caught up into heaven Elisha was there and he saw that happen he knew that this existed he had seen it and there's no indication he saw it here in 2 Kings chapter 6 he didn't have to see it because he believed it once you believe it once you get to walking by faith faith becomes more real to you than physical sight you know, the building that we're in right now, we, I gave this testimony last night or yesterday or sometime about the $3.2 million and we believe for it. And I put tape down on the floor. I spent hundreds of hours walking that facility and believing that that thing was done and seeing it by faith. I never stepped over the tape that signified there was a wall there. We had tape and then we had little juts where the door were and I always went over and acted like I was opening the door. I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. <laughs> I was seeing by faith. I was using my faith to see that thing done. I put uh, five gallon buckets down and eight, four by eight sheets of plywood on top of those buckets and I stood where the stage was gonna be and I preached entire sermons when there was not a single person in that whole building. And I preached and I saw myself and I saw that building complete and I saw this $3.2 million coming in. And then when we had the dedication, everybody was just going bananas. Everybody was praising God. This is a miracle. Look what God has done. And they were so excited. And I had this one girl come up to me, one of our students, and she says, you don't act that excited. What's wrong with you? And I said, I've already seen this thing years ago. I said, it's, this is anticlimactic. I'm already looking beyond this. I'm looking at the next thing. Did you know you can get to a place that when you see it with your eyes, that's not near as exciting as when you see it with your heart. I saw that building done and I rejoiced thousands of times before anybody could see anything. And when you got to where you could see it with your eyes, that was no big deal. I know some of you again think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. This is how God made us to live, is to walk by faith, to see things that can't be seen. You know, we had a uh, meeting for our Bible college one time and we rented a hotel uh, room. It was about 300 people or something like that in there. And Jamie was up leading the praise and worship and she was singing hallelujah. And I mean, it was just a powerful presence of the Lord. And I was, there was a center aisle and I was sitting on that side of the center aisle right there. And over here, there were these double doors and I had my eyes closed and I was just worshiping the Lord. And as I had my eyes closed, 
I saw the Lord open up those two doors over there. And I mean, just throw them open like this. And these doors just bam, went like that. And then they had these closers on them and they slowly closed behind him. He just threw the doors open, walked inside and stood there. And then these doors closed behind him. And then there were these two ladies over here on this side that I knew. And he went over and just touched one on the forehead. And when he did, this woman just fell flat of her face, spread eagle like this, laying out on the floor. And then there was two people in between them. And he went over and touched this other woman and just touched her on the head. And she hit her knees and lifted her hands and started worshiping the Lord. And what I was seeing with my eyes closed, I was seeing this in my heart. It was so real that I opened up my eyes and looked over there. And as soon as I opened up my eyes, within a second or so, those doors just wham, flew open like this and nobody was there. And I watched them and they just closed, but there was nobody there. Those doors just flew open and then they closed. David was in that meeting and he's, I've told this story before and David confirmed. He said he looked over there and saw that same thing. These doors just flew open and nobody was standing there. And then I kept looking and this first woman that I saw, all of a sudden, she just fell flat on her face, spread eagle on the ground, started worshiping the Lord. And then within a few seconds, the person, two people down, just hit their knees and lifted their hands and started worshiping the Lord. And everything I was seeing in my heart by the Spirit was happening in the physical, but it was happening about 15 or 20 seconds later. And I couldn't see Jesus I couldn't see what he was doing. All I could see was the physical results of what he was doing in the spiritual realm. And you know what I actually did? I closed my eyes because I could see better with my heart than I could see with my eyes. Amen. And when I closed my eyes, the Lord walked over to me and spoke some things to me. And then he started down that center aisle and he just touched people on one side. And I saw all of the people and you know what? I didn't remember where everybody was seated, but in my heart, I, I saw him walk up to people that I knew. And after the service was over, I went up to people and I didn't tell them anything. I just said, what did the Lord do for you? And they said, oh, he spoke this to me. And it's exactly what I heard Jesus speaking to these people. I could see better with my heart. I could hear better with my heart than I could see and hear with my eyes. And brothers and sisters, that's not intended to be once in a lifetime experience. This is the way that God made us to be. You can get to where you live by faith. You walk by faith. You can get to where what you believe is more real to you than what the doctor says, than what the lawyer says, than what the banker says, than what your mate says, than what your boss says. You can get to where God's word dominates you, but you can't do it accidentally. It's like I was talking about last night. You have to labor to enter into this rest. It takes effort to renew your mind. You just can't watch as the stomach turns all of the time on television and be spiritually minded. You're going to have to get into the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're going to have to spend time in prayer and fellowshipping with the Lord and letting God speak to you. It takes effort to renew your mind, but I tell you, it's well worth it. You know, I had an instance happen where I had to go get a physical for uh, insurance things. My board wanted me to take out insurance on this building that we had. So I went to get this EKG, and anyway, they uh, put these things on my chest. They wanted to shave my chest, and I told them, I said, this is virgin hair. It's never been done. <laughs> and anyway, I talked about a shaving the hair on my chest, and they put these... They put these six things on my chest and I did pretty good until 12 minutes or something. I got to sweating and those things started falling off. And so I was holding two and a nurse was holding two and the doctor was holding two as I was going through this treadmill test. And, and anyway, I witnessed to him about seeing my son raised from the dead, being dead for five hours and coming back to life. I was telling them about all of the good things of God. And after this test was over, this doctor was reading my test and, and everything was fine up until 12 minutes and 32 seconds or something. And you know, you could have quit at 10. I didn't even have to go that long, but I went through the whole 15 minute test and at 12 minutes and 32 seconds, he looked at it and then he started grunting. You know how these doctors do. Mm -hmm. He was looking at this and he's doing all of this stuff. And then he says, man, you got a serious problem here. 
And he, and he started writing this thing out and he says, I'm sending you over to a friend of mine. We're going to run tests on you and we're putting you in the hospital and you might have open heart surgery before the day is over. And you know, I'm, the reason I'm telling this is to illustrate that I, I've spent so much time in the word and believing God and believing what God said about me that it just was hard for me to accept what this doctor said. It wasn't what God said. And so I stood there for just a second and listened to him and kind of processed it. And then I didn't mean to do this. I wasn't trying to be rude, but it just, it just came out. I said, that's a lie. <laughs> and you know what? This doctor's not used to people telling him that what he said is a lie. And he just looked at me and I said, it's a lie. I don't believe any of this. I said, you look at that piece of paper and that tell me that that says I got a heart problem. And he instantly started backing up. He says, well, he says, you are one hundredth of a, a something or another off in this one spot. He said, the rest of the test is totally normal. And he says, everybody's heart's different. It could have been an anomaly. He didn't say it, but I thought it could have been when these things were falling off of me. <laughs> and he says, you could be perfectly normal. I just think we ought to go get you tested and stuff. And I said, that is not what you told me. You lied to me. You told me that I had a serious heart problem. And I got on this guy's case and rebuked him and this guy just tore up this paper and he says, you're fine, leave. <laughs> and I got out of there. And you know what? A woman ran out of gas on the, car, on the road right after I left his office and I got out and pushed her car uphill around the corner and I thought, pretty good for a guy that's got a serious heart problem. <laughs> And so he flunked me on my test for insurance. And so I had to go to this guy who's a friend of mine. He's on my board and he did one of these nuclear stress tests where they inject you with this dye and stuff. And turned out he said, I had a heart of a 17 year old. There wasn't a problem. He told me that, you know, these treadmill tests that you do at the doctors, he says they're wrong over 50% of the time. He says, never go by one of those. And yet I bet you the majority of people in here have done something like that and just take what they say as being gospel. I tell you what, doctor, there's a reason they have the highest malpractice rates in the world. I'm not against doctors. I'm just saying they're people. They make mistakes and stuff. And yet most of us would take the word of a doctor more than you would take what God's word says about you. But I've been meditating in the word so much that when somebody said something to me contrary to what God said to me, I said no. What I believe in my spirit is more real to me than the physical realm. In the natural realm, everybody's saying it's a recession. You can't build a $53 million complex debt-free. Don't wake me up. We're well on our way. We're over 70% of the way to having that first building paid for. It's gonna happen. I tell you, it's a blessing to just be simple and not complicated. It's just simple, I'm just simple. And I'm telling you, many of us are just so carnal, so dominated by your physical senses that you couldn't stand and believe God if the doctor didn't confirm it, if the lawyer didn't confirm it, if your banker didn't confirm it. You trust the word of people more than you trust the word of God. And I'm telling you, God loves you. He's not mad at you, but you aren't going to succeed. That's not faith. Faith is seeing with your heart, things that you can't see with your physical eyes based on the word of God. It's being sensitive to the Lord and you can walk by faith and not by sight. You do not have to be limited to what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. I have people come to me all the time. I'm so depressed and discouraged and I, I wish I could just preach this message that I've done for an hour and give it to people all at once and I can't do it. And, and it's frustrating because they don't realize that they are just fixated on what's happened in the natural. But there is so much good going on in the spiritual. God loves them. If they're born again, they've got the life of God. They've got love and joy and peace. Their spirit is never depressed. It's never discouraged. There is no reason for them to be depressed. There is if you look at it only in a human way. But if you look at what we've got in the spirit, and how abundant that is compared to our problems here in the flesh, they are not even worthy to be compared. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, what I've talked about this morning 
is the answer to all of our problems. If we could just get to where we perceive what God is doing, what he has done, if we could walk by faith instead of by sight, if we could live in the spirit instead of living in the flesh, your problems are over. And if you would do that, then the way you think in your heart is the way it will be in your physical world. Your body would start getting well. You would start rejoicing. Your finances would prosper. Everything would change in the natural if you would just begin to start living in the supernatural and walking by faith. And brothers and sisters, this is not hard. It's really simple. It's super simple. The only thing that makes it hard is it takes effort and you can't go by just quality time. It takes quantity time. Being in the presence of God. It's going to cost you. Some of you are watching adultery and lying and murdering and stealing. And you aren't going to be as sensitive to God if you live in that realm. It's going to cost you some of the junk that you do and read and things that you do. You're going to have to spend time with God. It's not going to happen accidentally. It, it has to be done on purpose. But if you could understand that there's a spiritual world, man, this would just transform your life. And the way, only way to access the spiritual world, godly spiritual world, is through the Word of God and prayer. Amen. You can access the spiritual world through demonic stuff, and that's relatively easily easy, but that'll kill you. If you want to get into God and start walking by faith, you're going to have to do it through the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word.